Hello again and welcome back. Hope everybody had a chance to get second round of, of caffeine this morning and, um, and, uh, and I'm excited to be able to introduce our, our last lecture of the morning. Um, it'll be delivered by Dr. Apara Dave on tick-borne illnesses in New Hampshire. And, and for those who weren't able to attend the session yesterday afternoon, um, Dr. Dave was also a presenter then and she presented on post-COVID condition. Um, that lecture, I've received a lot of positive feedback from already uh, on behalf of, of Dr. Dave, and the lecture is available online for those who weren't able to attend yesterday. Um, it will be available uh, through the remainder of the calendar year. Um, in review, Dr. Dave uh, is an infection disease specialist practicing out of Exeter, New Hampshire. Um, having trained at Brown University and fellowship through Beth Israel Deaconess. As I mentioned, Dr. Dave is back today um, to speak on the local epidemiology, common clinical syndromes, and treatment options for tick-borne illnesses specific to New Hampshire. It's again my pleasure to introduce Dr. Apara Dave. So before we dive into this talk, I just wanted to take the liberty to tie up a few loose ends from yesterday. So one of our audience members, I believe, had asked about guidelines for post-COVID condition. So the CDC did publish some very general uh, guidelines over the summer. They're available on the CDC website if you basically just look up CDC post-COVID condition. There's not a lot of specific treatment guidelines, um, but it does outline the, the, the um, condition definition. And then um, someone had asked about the geographical distribution, both nationally and internationally. Um, there's not a lot there I could find, but in children, the multi-system inflammatory condition in children um, mimics really well the regional epidemiologic curves. So, um, and if there's more questions that come up, please don't hesitate to, to reach out to me directly. So shifting topics, we're gonna talk about something that I think is near and dear to most of our hearts, um, tick-borne illness in New Hampshire. Um, still no financial uh, conflicts of interest. <laughs> And we're going to be talking about all the havoc that this little guy wreaks in our state and nationwide. So I'll start with the case so again. Start with the case again. This, was somebody that I, this was somebody that I saw after their acute presentation, a 57-year-old gentleman, a few comorbidities, but overall fairly healthy and active, and was presenting with three weeks of fevers. Um, he had actually seen his primary care, um, was diagnosed with uh, bronchitis. I'm not sure maybe just on the basis of fevers, received um, a course of azithromycin, um, but didn't feel much better. And so ultimately presented to our local emergency room. Um, in the ER, he had a mild leukopenia, um, thrombocytopenia, LFTs maybe slightly elevated. An initial uh, Lyme ELISA screen was negative. Um, and part of the initial test bundle at that time was um, antibodies for anaplasma and babesia, which were also negative. So on his initial presentation, he actually looked sick enough that he ended up in the hospital for a day. Um, he got a couple doses of ceftriaxone, felt maybe a little better, not quite there yet. They said, you probably have something viral, give it a few days, you should be fine. Um, and then two, three weeks later, he's still having daily fevers to over 100, up to 102. And interestingly, um, late afternoon to overnight were when he was mostly experiencing these. So any thoughts? All right, so I know the title gives it away a little bit. <laughs> His anaplasma PCR was positive, not surprisingly. Um, and then actually on my drive over here, I was speaking with um, one of our clinical pharmacists and she was telling me that um, one of our hospitalized patients had their blood smear come back for anaplasma. Um, and my reaction to that was, wow, that's so cool. And she said, you get excited about really weird things. But um, they actually saw on the blood smear, which was really looking for Babesia, they saw 
anaplasma in the um, neutrophils, which is another easy way to die or quick way to diagnose anaplasmosis. Not quite the same sensitivity as the blood smears for Babesia. Um, so this gentleman was started on outpatient doxycycline twice a day and really within a couple days had a dramatic improvement in his symptoms. So never had a um, recollection of a tick bite, which is true for most tick-borne illness. So the ticks most um, common in New Hampshire that you need to be aware of from a disease transmission standpoint, obviously the ixoides or black-legged tick is the most common offender. Um, Lone star ticks and uh, dog ticks, um, amblyopium and um, dermacenter, also are vectors of less common tick-borne diseases in the state. And you can see here, um, dog tick is usually the biggest, but the black-legged tick, especially in its early larval and nymph forms, is tiny, so very easy to miss. Um, these are the main diseases you should be aware of um, transmitted by the Ixoides tick, so obviously first and foremost Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, and babesiosis. Those are the three that whenever you're evaluating someone for um, a possible tick-borne illness clinical syndrome, we want to make sure that you actually do send testing for all three. Um, Powassan virus is less common, but we've certainly seen case reports um, over the past few years. That is a viral encephalitis. There's no specific treatment. It's mostly supportive, but um, making the diagnosis can be very helpful since uh, often those, these patients have a vague clinical syndrome and get, you know, considerable amounts of other testing and often a hospitalization. Um, Borrelia miyamotoi is another species of Borrelia that pre, um, presents very similar to an anaplasmosis-like illness. And then Ehrlichia um, is re closely related to anaplasmosis. At one point in the distant past, they were actually considered the same illness. Anaplasmosis tends to be a bit more acute, and anaplasmosis tends to be more common in our neck of the woods. Ehrlichia, much more common um, on the southeastern seaboard. When I was a resident um, in North Carolina, we saw a fair number of Ehrlichia cases. So this is the distribution of the black-legged tick, um, and it really can extend um, further west. It's not, you know, traditionally thought of as the, the range, but the bulk of them live on the eastern part of the country. Occasionally you will see um, a scattering of these ticks and associated diseases on the west coast. This is the life cycle, and I think it's actually important to understand the life cycle, to understand how it perpetuates, particularly the Lyme reservoir. So the life cycle is two to three years, um, which is on the longer side for insects. Um, eggs are laid in spring, and over the summer, those larvae feed on small animals, rodents, mice, rats, birds, and that's um, really the animal reservoir for Lyme disease. So when these larvae feed on mice, that's when they become um, Lyme positive. Then you move into the fall when a lot of um, human infections tend to happen. They move on from small animal to um, larger animal targets for feeding. And that's where you'll get deer, um, small, uh, smaller mammals such as foxes, raccoons, and also humans. So one of the reasons we tend to see a bump in Lyme infections at the end of the summer, early fall, is that's when the transition from larva feeding on small animals to larger animals is happening. And then they're dormant for the winter. And in spring, they emerge as nymphs. Um, and that's when we'll see another, and nymphs that, you know, the prior summer have already been infected with Lyme by feeding on the small animals. And so in the spring, we'll see another bump in Lyme cases when these nymphs are emerging and feeding on larger mammals like raccoons, foxes, deer, and humans. Um, and so then they go through the rest of the life cycle. By the end of summer, their adults go on to lay eggs the following spring, and the life cycle repeats. So mice and rodents are where the small animal reservoir lies. You've probably seen some um, Lyme reduction efforts targeted towards that small animal reservoir. You know, tick tubes would really target the mice. Um, and then I think just important to know that, you know, larvae, later stage larvae and nymphs and adults will tend to favor larger feeding targets. So 
across, uh, there is a good surveillance program in New Hampshire, and across the board, 60% of these ixoides or black-legged ticks actually test positive for Lyme. So if you find a black-legged tick on you or a patient says they've had a black-legged tick, chances are at least 50% or more that it was Lyme positive. So what about the bacterial culprit here? Lyme is a spirochete or spiral-shaped bacteria, kind of small and narrow, um, not visible on standard microscopy, as most of you probably know, so that's an ENM image there. Um, and it is not readily cultured, so it's not going to grow in blood cultures, urine cultures. Um, the Burgdorferi species accounts for the vast majority of cases in the U.S., um, including New England. And then there's a few Mayoni cases in the Midwest. Again, the bulk of them are still Burgdorferi. What's interesting, and I've had over the years several patients who feel they contracted Lyme in Europe and had positive testing in Europe, um, and the, species, the predominant species um, across the Atlantic are different. So, and may not show up on US testing. So just something to keep in mind if you have a patient with the right uh, geographic risk factors. So clinical disease. Um, once you get a tick bite from a Lyme positive tick, what's the disease process? Early localized disease, which is typically known as the erythema migrans rash, only occurs in maybe 50 to 75% of cases, depending on what source you go to. The main CDC actually says it could be only about half. Um, some estimates are a little bit higher, and that's directly related to local infiltration of the bacteria at the site of the tick bite. Um, and that happens as soon as three days or up to a month after the tick bite, the average is probably about a week. I think the takeaway here is lack of an erythema migrans rash does not rule out Lyme disease. Um, so some people get early localized disease and don't necessarily spread to um, other stages or if they do it's subclinical. But spirochetemia, so distribution of the bacteria throughout the bloodstream, actually does occur pretty early in the course of illness, a couple of days following the tick bite, and mimics a general viral syndrome. Fatigue, arthralgias, myalgias, feeling washed out, that's sort of the most common symptom. Fever, or at least high fevers, are uncommon, maybe in you know, 20 to 30% of patients or less, um, but really feels like you know, they have a viral illness, feels run down. This is the classic um, erythema migrans rash, the sort of bullseye. Um, it's worth noting that there's a lot of variability in how this rash can appear. So even if there's not a classic bullseye lesion with the dot and the clearing and the ring around it, it doesn't mean it's not a Lyme rash. So, and um, the New Hampshire State, um, or DHHS is in the process of um, updating some information, and there should be a, a nice informational poster that sort of illustrates the different types of early Lyme rashes, that, or how early Lyme rashes could be manifested. So early disseminated disease following um, spirochetemia in the early days, where does the bacteria like to go? Um, so there's a couple places the peripheral nervous system, the central nervous system, and the heart. So peripheral nervous system, one of the most common clinical syndromes is a Bell's palsy. I think in New Hampshire, when evaluating a patient with Bell's palsy, Lyme has to be, you know, top of the differential. Um, radiculopathy, Banworth syndrome is very interesting, um, and it seems to be more common with some of the European strains of Lyme, but it's actually um, a, can be a pretty severe clinical presentation with back pain and an associated distal weakness um, and, and neuropathy. Other peripheral neuropathies are also very common with peripheral nervous system Lyme. And then central nervous system disease, so in early disseminated disease, this is, clinically meningitis. So these patients are presenting with severe headaches, um, neck pain, photophobia, really look like a clinical viral meningitis. And the CSF findings can be quite variable. Usually they have a pleocytosis, um, but the pleocytosis can be pretty minimal. Um, and they may not have you know, necessarily neutrophil predominance. It could also very well be a lymphocyte predominance. So I, uh, unexciting CSF doesn't rule out Lyme meningitis. That's just a reminder of Bell's palsy. 
classic facial droop, but don't forget about, you know, they're not able to close their eye properly, so talking to them about protecting the eye, keeping it from drying out. And the third place that Lyme likes to go in the um, early disseminated phase is the heart. And so the degree of cardiac abnormalities and conduction abnormalities can be pretty variable. Uh, hospitalized patients will come in with, you know, full-blown third-degree block. Uh, however, they can just be a mild, you know, mild conduction abnormality, first degree, minimally symptomatic. Um, so the spectrum of clinical disease is pretty variable. Last summer, I had two previously healthy 40-year-olds in the ICU at the same time due to uh, complete heart block from Lyme. And it can also cause pericarditis and myocarditis. They'll be, these patients will be coming in with you know, pleuritic chest pain, um, shortness of breath, uh, other um, chest pain complaints that could be concerning for either respiratory infection or coronary syndrome, but clearly they don't fit that clinical picture. And then we move on to late stage. So we want to differentiate late stage Lyme from uh, persistent symptoms following Lyme. Late stage Lyme is um, still on the clinical spectrum of Lyme disease and can be months to years after the initial infection. And the patient may or may not have a history of clinically manifest early Lyme disease. So if you have someone with a blown up knee, just because they don't report a history of an erythema migrans rash um, you know, a couple years ago does not rule out Lyme arth uh, arthritis. Late stage disease typically manifests as either arthritis or neurologic Lyme. And this is different from early disseminated where you have a clear meningitis type picture. This is really Lyme encephalopathy. And if you do neurocognitive um, testing on them, there's clear uh, um, abnormalities and delays in their neurocognitive testing. So that brings us to, you know, how do we diagnose Lyme? And that is, uh, full disclosure, it's obviously an area of some disagreement. Um, the existing testing right now is typically you start with a screen, which is an ELISA or immunofluorescent assay, and that reflexes to a Western blot. Um, ELISA is sort of the initial quick and dirty, quick turnaround time, and then once that flag's positive, they'll send it out to the lab for Western blot. The turnaround time on that can be, you know, a couple days. Uh, false positive ELISAs can occur in other conditions, so acute viral illness, autoimmune conditions can all cause a false positive ELISA. The Western blot is typically thought of as more specific um, and as you probably are well familiar, there's two components to the Western blot, the IgM and the IgG. The IgM measures up to five bands, the IgG measures up to 10 bands, and these antibodies in Lyme can persist for years. And that's not just the IgG. Interestingly, the IgM antibodies can also persist for years. So if you have someone you treated this summer for Lyme disease had a positive IgM, that may very well persist three years down the line. Um, and so this is just a graphic highlighting, you know, two-tiered testing for Lyme. You start with the ELISA. If it's positive or equivocal, that goes to the Western blot. Most labs are running both the IgG and IgM. Um, and then if it's negative, you could stop or consider repeat testing if they're in the early stages of disease. Now, a couple years ago, the FDA approved a modified two-tiered approach, and this does away with the Western blot completely. It's actually two ELISA tests, um, slightly different. The turnaround time is much faster because these two can actually be run um, at the same time or one after the other, and the sensitivity improves by about 25% or 30% in early disease um, without any corresponding loss in specificity since you have the two ELISAs. So just out of curiosity, is anyone using the modified two-tiered Lyme test right now in their clinical practice? No, okay. So I'm gonna guess that means most people are still doing ELISA with Western blot reflex. Some other testing options that you may hear about um, but are typically not widely clinically available, 
um, C6 peptide serologic testing, so that measures antibodies to um, a C6 peptide that's on the Borrelia bacteria. It's highly antigenic, so common to produce antibodies to this, um, and they can develop pretty early in the course of illness, even within the first week. So theoretically might be better a, a better test in early disease. These are not widely commercially available in humans. On the veterinary side, I believe that C6 um, testing is more commonly utilized. And then a word about PCR testing. So uh, Lyme PCR serum testing is widely available for the most part. However, in the um, serum and urine, it's typically not as clinically useful. It doesn't have great sensitivity. Um, for Lyme arthritis, it can be helpful, uh, though, and, and certainly if it's positive, you want to consider Lyme arthritis. However, as with any PCR test, it can't differentiate between live and dead bacterium. And then uh, CSF is another place where it may have some clinical utility, but it doesn't have the best sensitivity. So a Lyme meningitis patient, if their, uh, their CSF PCR is negative, it does not rule out Lyme meningitis. If it's positive, that's helpful. So treatment, another area of controversy. Um, in early localized disease, the current guidelines, and IDSA just um, updated their guidelines about a year ago. It was a joint effort between IDSA, American College of Rheumatology, and American Association of Neurology. So multidisciplinary guidelines. Um, they, at this point, are recommending doxycycline really for 10 days. Um, for early localized disease. And if you go with a beta-lactam option, either amoxicillin or cefiroxime, two weeks. Um, doxycycline seems to be first line in the US for the most part. There is a cultural difference in practice across the Atlantic. Europe tends to utilize beta-lactams as first line treatment. Uh, the good thing about doxycycline is it will treat co-infection with anaplasma. A two for one deal there. Um, early disseminated disease. So if it's limited to their peripheral nervous system, you can still start with PO therapy. The response rates are as good as IV, um, and the treatment duration tends to be two to three weeks. If they do have meningitis, then at that point, you really want to be starting them with IV treatment um, up to three weeks. And then carditis, it depends on their level of acuity when they present. If they have early um, AV block, they do not meet criteria for hospitalization, they can actually be managed outpatient with oral antibiotics, serial EKGs. If their conduction abnormalities are severe enough that they require hospitalization, you want to put them on IV ceftriaxone until the conduction abnormalities resolve. And once that's the case, then they can be switched over to oral antibiotics for the remainder of their treatment. Um, and then late disease, Lyme arthritis. Uh, the treatment, so this is where we really start with 28 days of treatment up front. Um, and the standard approach is starting with 28 days of PO, and if that is ineffective, then moving to um, 28 days of IV treatment. So what about the long-term sequelae? And so this um, goes by multiple different names. So chronic Lyme falls into this category, persistent symptoms after Lyme, post-Lyme syndrome, and it's actually very common. 15% um, of patients is a common estimate. It may be higher. Uh, the criteria, at least according to CDC, are confirmed Lyme disease. So you have to have had a clinical picture consistent with Lyme or a positive test at some point earlier. Um, and then that needs to be followed by some appropriate stabilization or resolution of those um, clinical Lyme symptoms with appropriate treatment at that time. And then following that, within six months, onset of fatigue, diffuse musculoskeletal pain, cognitive difficulties, seeing some overlap between post-COVID condition here, um, and interfering with their daily uh, functioning. So why does this happen, and why does it not happen in 
all Lyme patients. Uh, we don't really understand the risk factors well. Um, there's some early data um, out of uh, University of Virginia suggesting is there some persistent inflammation by taking some of the uh, proteins on the Borrelia bacteria and injecting them into mice, not the bacteria itself, but just the proteins, they're able to reproduce a lot of these symptoms. So is there some antigenic protein on the Borrelia that's causing an immune trigger? Possibly. Um, another hypothesis that's been thrown out there is persistent infection. Uh, and there is some, there is evidence of particularly bone and cartilage tissue damage um, in this setting and in these patients with these long-term long sequelae of Lyme disease. To date, uh, several randomized control trials haven't demonstrated benefit from additional antibiotic therapy. And I, I will fully acknowledge that there is controversy and differing opinions on how to best manage these patients. So the exclusion criteria, these are a bit strict, but um, if you have, the first one makes a lot of sense, that if you have a confirmed and untreated co-infection, you need to treat that first and see if some of the symptoms get better. Um, any objective abnormalities on labs or cognitive functioning really should push you to some of the clinical stages of Lyme, like you know Lyme encephalopathy, Lyme arthritis. Um, preceding conditions such as fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue, technically are an exclusion criteria. However, for a lot of patients, that can be tough because you could certainly have pre-existing chronic fatigue, get Lyme disease, and then have persistent symptoms following Lyme disease, and no alternative explanations. So uh, coming back to this, the information, the data that we have to date, looking at long-term antibiotics in these patients and does it seem to help? In 280 patients out of Europe, they were um, randomized to 12 weeks of antibiotics versus placebo, no difference at up to one year follow-up in terms of quality of life, um, and of course, notable rate of drug reactions. Similar um, uh, conclusions in the United States, a smaller group of patients, but again, three months of, they used both IV and PO antibiotics, no difference at follow-up in quality of life index. And in the patients that were on antibiotics, there were cases of catheter-associated infections or C. diff, and some, some cases of anaphylaxis. So what is the best way to help these patients? And that is something that I struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis in my clinical practice. I think we don't have all the answers yet, there are some innovative treatment approaches. And so similar to post-COVID condition, there have been well-established programs that take a multidisciplinary approach. So typically there is a rehab medicine physician heading this, um, using occupational therapy, uh, physical therapy, and typically um, behavioral therapy as well. And they, they often do um, group therapy sessions, which seems to be really helpful for these patients as well. They do have good success rates, and they also, it's interesting, they take the focus off of why is this happening and how do we medically fix that why, and really shift it to this is what your symptoms are, how can we get you functioning again and living your life again? And so that's really ultimately what patients want, is they want to be able to go about their typical daily activities. So for that, these programs have good success rates. The problem is there's not nearly enough of them. Um, I haven't checked recently, but the last time I tried to send somebody to the Dean Center for Tick-Borne Illness at Spalding in Massachusetts, they were unfortunately were not taking new patients. for um, post-Lyme symptoms? So it's a good question. Um, to, meet, to meet criteria for, um, for that condition, you have to have a confirmed or probable case of Lyme. So if you have a positive test serology, and I believe last I checked, the Dean Center was requiring a positive test. Um, it, you know, that makes it a little bit more clear cut. However, no test is perfect. And so the, in early infection, it's pretty well established that the Lyme testing is not accurate. And so in early infection, you can't base your diagnosis on the test. It's really a clinical diagnosis. In later infection, um, the accuracy of that test 
is, is contested. Some people say it's still not as good as 50 to 60%. Others say it's as good as 90%. Um, based on my review of the literature, I think the truth is probably somewhere in between, probably close to 75 to 80%. So in later stage disease, most people should have a positive test. Um, and most people who have had symptoms for more than a year, that number is typically higher. Um, above 80%. However, it's not 100%. And so I think that's where you fall back on, did they have a clinical syndrome that could have been Lyme meningitis, that could have been Lyme carditis, that probably would have come to light if they had significant condu conduction abnormalities, or a Lyme arthritis um, that you can say, yes, this really fits the clinical picture of um, early disseminated or later Lyme, and now we're looking at the post-Lyme post sequelae. So let me actually pause there um, and see if there's other questions related to Lyme before we move on to some of these other infections. Yes. Right. <laughs> and Dr. Dove, if you don't mind just repeating the question for those. Uh... Oh, sure. The question was about the vaccine. Um, and it's available in veterinary medicine, but not for humans. Um, not that I'm aware of in terms of active clinical trials right now. But it is an area that, uh, that is being pushed for by a lot of folks with Lyme disease. Hi, Dr. Dave. Um, what do you do for someone that's had Lyme once and now you're considering another diagnosis of it? I'm sorry, uh, what do I do for somebody who's yeah, for had testing, Lyme once? For testing and, you know, you're deciding whether their IgG and IgM is positive again or is residual. Right. So I do typically, that's a really good question, um, because given where we live, you can get Lyme more than once. It's not common, but it certainly does occur. I typically will still repeat the testing and see, you know, is there a market shift in either their IgM or IgG? If there is, and I tend to say, okay, you know, this is probably consistent with the reinfection, we should retreat you. If there's not, I end up really looking at their clinical syndrome and does this fit with Lyme? Um, and I will say that given where we live, I typically have a low threshold to give people two weeks of doxycycline and a very high threshold to do anything more than that. Thank you. I think that somewhat spoke to my question. I'm a primary care internist in Hanover, and we get so many tick calls that I, we can't see all the patients at all. So there's many calls about I got bit by a tick. I mean, one is certainly I have a tick crawling on me. That one's pretty easy. But then we have the I just pulled the tick off. It's been there how long? So we sometimes do two, the dose of 200 milligrams, which I mm -hmm. was wondering if you were going to speak a little more. Yes, I will. The so efficacy of that. Okay. Yep. It's and like then, you. It's like you were planted with that question, so hold Perfect. that thought. And then lots of times we get a picture of the bite, which just looks like an irritated tick bite. It looks like it's about, you know, one, it's about four millimeters to half a centimeter across. And a lot of times we just do two weeks of doxy because we see so much Lyme. So I was wondering, yeah, it sounds yeah. like you started speaking to that. I think that's probably appropriate given where we live and given that the EM rash doesn't occur in everybody and the presentation of the EM rash can be variable. And it's much easier to say you got two weeks of doxycycline and early Lyme than a year down the line be talking about, well, I might have had Lyme at that time and it wasn't treated. So, um, along the same lines, uh, when Lyme was first described and, and there was a, if you get the tick, if you know it wasn't there 48 hours ago, you don't need to be treated. And then it became 24 hours. Is there any time frame? between if somebody can say, I, I know absolutely I didn't have that there X hours ago, and now I have a tick bite. Do you pay any attention to that anymore? I, I, I tend to pay less attention to that. If people are like 100% sure that it wasn't there in the morning and then it was there in the evening and they got rid of it, then I'm willing to let that slide. But most people don't recall their tick bite. And the nymphs are so tiny that are you really sure it wasn't there, you know, 24 hours ago. So I do allow some flexibility around that, just knowing what we know about being, it being really hard to, um, to find a tick on you and most people not having a history of a tick bite. So, and I think I'll take one more and then I want, I'm gonna keep going. 
Yes. Uh, first of all, the, uh, the Limerix vaccine was voluntarily withdrawn from the market. It was never declared a bad vaccine right. by the FDA. So why don't we just get that? I don't know the answer um, to that, yeah. The follow-up is, you know, I, I did my residency in Connecticut and I had a private practice in Old Saybrook for many years, which is right across the river from Old Lyme. The case you presented, we would have put them on 10 to 14 days of doxycycline on the presumption in the summer that it was Lyme disease until proven otherwise. And many of those patients neg never seroconverted. And conversely, sometimes patients would talk us into the Western blot and they'd be positive without ever having experienced any clinical symptoms. So the testing is awkward and, and to not treat a person with what could very well be Lyme disease, I, I don't know. I see that a lot around here, but you know, in Connecticut, your patient on presentation would have been treated with doxy, I think. Right. And so I think that is completely true, that particularly for early Lyme, you cannot rely on the test because they will not have had enough time to turn positive. And if they are treated appropriately in early Lyme, they may not seroconvert. And so that's why particularly at initial presentation, you really need to rely on your clinical diagnosis. Um, early, uh, later on, excuse me, they, the serologic testing becomes more accurate for sure. There is obviously variability in how accurate and debate around that. Um, okay, last one. <laughs> So that's a good question. So I usually tease out the penicillin allergy more because the vast majority of those are not true allergies. And, um, and so that's a separate conversation that I would love to have with you afterwards, but probably 80 to 85% of reported beta-lactam allergies are not real. And even if they're allergic to penicillin, they can probably take cefiroxy. So moving on to anaplasma. Um, a little bit less controversial, um, caused by an intracellular bacteria that grows within the neutrophils, can be visible on blood smear, but really the test of choice is the PCR. And in New Hampshire, cases are increasing. That should say more than 300 in 2017, and that number has continued to go up over the last few years. Same tick, black-legged tick. Um, and it presents really as an acute flu-like illness, so the incubation can be a couple weeks get systemic symptoms. Um, a petechial rash is uncommon, but can be a tip off for anaplasmosis. And I've seen on multiple occasions, these patients can really linger for weeks with mild infection. Severe cases can really look like acute sepsis. I've had a patient flip into AFib and then require getting intubated um, with the proximal cause of that being anaplasmosis. Leukopenia and elevated LFTs, low platelets are sort of the key laboratory findings that you want to be aware of. If you see that pattern on labs, you want to think anaplasmosis. Um, elevated creatinine, elevated lactate, and severe disease are certainly possible. And the diagnosis PCR is really the test of choice. Um, if you see the bacteria in the um, polys that's pathognomonic, but doesn't often happen. Um, and antibody testing does not have a role in the acute period. Um, if you want to do convalescent testing a couple weeks down the line, certainly could, but it's not really gonna change clinical management. And the treatment is doxycycline, at least until they are afebrile and for a minimum of 10 days. And then Babesia. So this is a very interesting uh, infection. It's sort of the malaria of our area. It infects the red blood cells and follows a clinical pattern very similar to sort of a malaria light, where you will get you know, lysis of the red blood cells as the um, parasite lyses them and then spreads to the rest of the bloodstream. You get a parasitemia, you get fevers, it infects new red blood cells, and the process repeats itself. Um, and in terms of absolute reported cases, there was, this was higher in New Hampshire than the anaplasmosis. I wonder if some of that is under diagnosis of anaplasma. And um, the other thing to keep in mind is while this is transmitted by the black-legged tick, there have also been over 200 cases reported through blood transfusion in the US. Those cases tend to be milder and tend to have a longer time to clinical presentation.
The acute illness um, incubation period is longer than anaplasmosis and even longer still if they acquired it through blood transfusion. And most healthy young people will actually clear this infection on their own. So it could be completely asymptomatic, they may never come to light for treatment, and they will be just fine. And so you can see how then it may creep into the blood supply as these patients then become donors at some point in the future. Um, and it can be completely asymptomatic to fulminant resulting in death. Fever is the most common clinical symptom, sort of the usual typical constellation of symptoms. Um, and if you see babesiosis, remember to look for anaplasma and Lyme. Severe babesiosis is defined as a parasitemia of 4% or higher, or a hemoglobin of less than 10. Um, risk factors for severe illness, HIV patients, older patients greater than 60, Asplenia is a big risk factor, and then other forms of immunosuppression. Severe disease is, you know, full-blown, either severe malaria or sepsis-like picture. So renal failure due to the microangiopathic um, damage from the lysis of red blood cells, DIC, respiratory distress, and um, lab findings kind of mirror the pathogenesis. So anemia, low platelets, um, you will often see elevated LFTs, so similar to anaplasmosis. The diagnosis, if you're suspecting Babesia, this is where it's really helpful to get a blood smear. Uh, the blood smear should diagnose severe disease because a 4% parasitemia is really, really difficult to miss. Our lab routinely reports parasitemia of 0.4%. 0.8%, so very mild disease. Um, and the blood smear turnaround is typically gonna be quicker than the PCR. The PCR is much higher sensitivity, including for low level uh, disease. And again, similar to anaplasmosis, not a huge role for antibody testing in the acute illness. So treatment. If they have mild to moderate disease, low parasitemia, their labs look okay, it can actually be managed outpatient. And the treatment is oral um, atovaquone and azithromycin. For severe disease, you're gonna be looking at hospitalization and IV azithro and oral atovaquone. There was another treatment regimen with clindamycin and quinine, but azithromycin and atovaquone has been shown to be equally effective and much more readily available. Um, and you wanna be doing a minimum of 10 days. A lot of these patients will get treated for longer. And you wanna do serial blood smears every couple days until their parasitemia is consistently going down. Um, and then for severe parasitemia, you're gonna be looking at transfer to a tertiary care center for exchange transfusion. So a few quick words on um, other ticks that cause problems in New Hampshire, the Lone Star tick. Um, not as common in New Hampshire, but is the vector for Ehrlichia. Um, Starry, which is Southern Tick-Associated Rash Illness. Um, it's basically similar in presentation to Lyme. Um, tularemia, which once in a while we will see cases of in New Hampshire, not necessarily from tick bites, but tick can be a, ticks can be a vector. And then heartland virus, which I don't, I'm not aware of any cases in New Hampshire. And there's the distribution. You can see it just touches southern New Hampshire and Maine. And then the dog tick. So the primary reason to be aware of this is this is a vector for Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And so even just a couple years ago, there was a case in Massachusetts. They are exceedingly rare, but it can happen. Most of the cases of Rocky Mountain spotted fever are again on the southeastern seaboard. So a few words on prevention. Prevention is the best medicine. New Hampshire is sort of, ground zero for tick-borne illness across the country, particularly Lyme. We've had over 1,700 cases reported. The actual number is probably much higher. And so a few preventative measures that I usually take the time to review with patients, you know, long pants, you're not gonna be winning any fashion awards for going hiking like this, but it should help those little buggers from getting up under your pants. Permethrin treated clothing can actually be quite effective, and so if I have patients that are routinely outside, I recommend that they consider this. Repellent, so DEET is definitely the most effective for ticks. 
um, and a 25% deep gives you about five hours of protection in normal activity. Um, you don't want to use any more than 25% or 30% in the pediatric population. Picaridin is not quite as effective, but still effective. For ticks, it's only about an hour, and so now you're running into potential reapplication depending on how long you're planning to be at risk. I will point you to, there's the EPA actually has a great website where you can plug in, do you want protection from ticks or mosquitoes or both? What ingredients are you looking for? What activities are you planning? And it'll spit out a list of options for you. So I would encourage everyone to check this out, both for their own use and for patients. And then this is taken from the website Tick Free New Hampshire, but these are common areas where ticks like to hang out. And so these, if you're doing tick checks, these are the areas you wanna focus. They're typically sort of warm, moist areas. Um, tick checks and then showering immediately after coming um, in from outdoors may help wash off some of the ticks that haven't attached yet. And just a few tips for clearing you know, around the yard and uninviting ticks from your, from your backyard. Spraying is an area that's pretty controversial. It does reduce the tick burden for sure. It is unclear how much it reduces disease because if you're not gonna get ticks in your backyard, but if you're still out hiking the trails or enjoying you know, our state outside and other parts, you're still at risk. And then mice tick tubes, they, again, they will reduce the immediate tick burden, but does it really help disease? It's not really clear. So what do you do if you find an attached tick? So no petroleum jelly, don't burn it off. Um, either use your fingers or tweezers, grab as close as you can to where the tick is attached and pull straight up. If there's a retained piece, it's okay. You can kind of, if it's causing irritation, that might be something that needs to be worked out. But getting the body of the tick out reduces the transmission risk. And then this is um, the doxycycline prophylaxis. Um, so that, so since these slides were made, that has been updated to more closer to 24 hours. Um, and you need to be able to start prophylaxis within 72 hours. And it is okay to use in our pediatric population as well. So there's no contraindication. Um, sorry, they can't have a, there's no contraindication in the pediatric population. You still need to be wary in pregnant patients or if they have a doxycycline allergy. And a few quick words on emerging tick-borne infections. So Miyamotoi, we talked about briefly. I've seen actually a couple cases of this. It's diagnosed via PCR, so you have to send the Borrelia Miyamotoi PCR from the serum. Treatment is doxycycline. Um, it, the clinical presentation is very similar to anaplasmosis. Um, Powassan encephalitis, similar to other viral encephalitis, except it's tick-borne, again, by the Ixoides tick. And the interesting thing about Powassan is the tick really doesn't have to be attached long to transmit. And then a really interesting one is red meat allergy, which I don't deal with in my clinical practice, but my allergy colleagues do. And it's actually um, an allergy to alpha-gal protein after multiple lone star tick bites or some sort of sensitization process. And it really is an almost anaphylactic-like reaction several hours after consuming red meat. So here are some good resources. Um, New Hampshire DHHS, tick-free New Hampshire, CDC. Um, I will say that recently there was a New Hampshire Legislative Commission on tick-borne testing particularly, and so they are in the process of releasing a publicly available report now. Um, but the take-home points from that commission were, you know, early disease test for Lyme, um, early testing for Lyme um, is not reliable, and late testing is you know, there was disagreement amongst commission members on how to best approach late testing, but I think, again, the bottom line is it's a little bit better, probably in the 75 to 80% range, but not quite 100. So with that, I'm happy, depending on how much time we have left, happy to take other questions. You have some time, and, and thank you very much, Dr. Dobbins. <laughs> All right, we will reopen the floor. Questions for Dr. Davi? Dr. Davi, how many 
pathogens can be in one tick. So, <laughs> right, should you be doing like your ELISA and the PCR and the blood smear or Lyme? Right, I can even, yeah, that's yeah. Also, and antiphysicians. And which is the one is, of those is the worst to have not treated or, yeah. So, depending on the patient, for most patients, in terms of acute illness, the anaplasma is probably the worst to miss. In the right patient, Babesia can certainly be more life-threatening. Um, so that's in the acute period. And then in the long-term period, neither, no, so anaplasma does not have a chronic phase. Babesia in immunocompromised patients can relapse, and so you often need to treat it for longer. But in terms of like thinking a year down the line, in that situation, the one you don't want to miss is Lyme. So in any patient with a concern for tick bite, I always send Lyme, anaplasma PCR, Babesia PCR, smear, and Mia, Borrelia miyamotoi PCR. <laughs> they actually, actually primary care is, because they typically come to me when their Babesia or their Borrelia miyamotoi is already positive. I'm typically not the, um, the first contact. First point of contact. We actually have a, a question from online. Uh, Dr. Dave, can you please talk a little bit about the California Lyme disease testing patients request uh, when the standard testing comes back negative? All right, so I believe the question was, can you tell me about patients requesting specific testing sometimes to California when their initial test is negative? So um, I do not, Obviously, I don't endorse any one specific brand of test over the other. Um, I have gotten that request, and so the, the Western, and what I think what they're referring to is there's a specialty lab in California that will do the Western blot, and they have their own interpretive criteria for the Western blot that are different than the CDCs. Um, and the threshold for a positive Western blot is lower. So what I usually tell patients is, if they already have had a Western blot, here are the Western blot results. Here's how many bands you have. Um, Western blot is tricky in that it can be a little bit user dependent and like, eh, is that band really positive? So on and so forth. But I tell them that like, look, these are the bands you have. These are the CDC criteria. I understand that uh, some clinicians may use slightly different criteria. I don't know if now that you have this information in hand, is getting another test going to be helpful or not? That's how I typically approach that. So I have kind of a fun case hot off the presses. Does anybody want to hear it? Anyone? Anyone? So I'll make it quick. And then the question is, what else should I send? So this was from Thursday, 52-year-old healthy female who works at Dartmouth in an administrative job called me and said she felt too sick to come in and see me, but she had arthralgias and chills, denied any fever, denied, had a mild headache, and otherwise review of systems was negative. No rash, no urinary symptoms, no bowel symptoms, and especially no respiratory symptoms no loss of taste or smell, et cetera, nothing that sounded like COVID. So I got her in the office yesterday, and um, she had also denied any outdoor exposure, said she hadn't even been out of the house in the last couple of weeks, hardly. So she came in the office yesterday um, to get some blood work, and I was gonna do a COVID test, which I decided she didn't need because on further questioning, again, no respiratory symptoms, no fever. She was 98.8 in the office and had said she started to feel better um, and felt human and was starting to eat again. Um, again, review of systems otherwise negative, except that she then said that morning she had seen a faint rash on her left thigh, which had since resolved, which was a little weird. And then she also said she had mowed the lawn two weeks ago. So I got labs, which I looked up during your presentation. <laughs> Sorry, so apologize for that. But So her platelets are 134, lower limit of normals 145. Her, C, her WBCs are 3.5, lower limit 4, creatinine 0.77, AST 87, ALT 26, and her CRP is 12.3. So yeah. you know the diagnosis. So, so I would be suspecting anaplasma, possibly absolutely. Lyme. Yep. Um, I, I have 
a low threshold to give people two weeks of doxycycline yeah. and a high threshold to do anything beyond that. Yeah. So I would probably, if that patient were coming to me, I would probably say it's probably tick-borne. Right. Let's give you two weeks of doxy and then send these additional tests. So the question was, it really a clinical case about that, you know, patient right. could have a lot of similar tick-borne illness symptoms? Yeah, quick, so a quick follow-up question is, I had already sent the doxy in, assuming it was one of the above, and so I'll call her today, tell her to pick it up and start it. But she, then do I send, what I don't normally do, because I see this a ton, is the other things you mentioned. So now should I, I had sent a tick panel, but then I wonder, should I actually send Miyamoto, should I send a smear, should I do those things kind of apropos to the other uh, physician's question? Or is that, you know, what's the utility of doing that in all of these patients? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, and it's really, you know, once you have somebody has a tick-borne illness, you're doing two weeks of doxycycline, what is the utility in, two, in sending all these additional tests? And I think it's really at that point diagnostic. If the symptoms don't resolve, it's worthwhile. Um, but otherwise, it's a discussion with the patient. I have patients that say, I feel better on the doxy. I don't feel like I need additional labs. And I have patients that say, I'd really like to know what happened. Um, so that, I think, is really an individual uh, patient, patient physician or clinician shared decision making. Do we have? Well, Dr. Davi, thank you again for, uh, for, for another fantastic lecture, and, and, uh, and, and thanks for the interaction here. Um, thank you. <laughs>